this class is basically the last class of our first chapter uh, from food to fashion, where we explored the intersection between food and fashion. And, but the first chapter from food to fashion looked at the best practices found in the food industry because it is an industry that is way ahead of the fashion industry when it comes to applying and maintaining regenerative systems. We're going to look at regenerative economies as a definition. There's so many definitions part of this class. Feel free to take screenshots. This class is in partnership with Tony Chocolonely. And for those of you who don't know, it's a chocolate company that is uh, an incredible um, <laughs> company uh, working to abolish poverty, working in transparency. And we're going to look at the best practices that Tony Chocolonely uh, is already implementing in the cocoa industry and how it is sort of applicable and parallel to the textile industry in the fashion industry, especially natural textile that rely on harvest. So what to expect in this class? Um, we're gonna learn about the ethical production of chocolate through the lens of social equity and environmental justice. And we're gonna look at the origin of the cocoa plant and the impact of colonialism, system design and good supply chain, the ethical production and trade, legislation and accountability. And at the very end, we have a special guest, Dr. Ariel Johnson, who is a food chemist. And we will learn more about her and the relationship between the ecosystem of chocolate taste and the environment in which chocolate is growing and how it impacts taste and how it impacts pretty much everything around the chocolate industry. But before I move to the next slide, I want to read this little paragraph uh, to you. One of the painful questions the cocoa sector has to ask itself is whether the sustainability efforts made in the past decade have led to actual impact. And you can replace cocoa sector with fashion industry because these issues are similar. An even more painful question is whether the scope of solutions is even in the ballpark of the scope of the problem. And we're gonna dive deeper into what that actually means through this class. So the first segment is the origin of cocoa plant and the impact of colonialism. In your opinion, and use the chat box to respond to this question, where does the best chocolate originate from? So, so far we have Switzerland, Belgium, great. Latin America as a continent. Okay, we're getting closer and closer. The answer is Ivory Coast, with the most production of chocolate coming from West Africa. Um, yes, you were right. There's Brazil, there's Ecuador, and there's South America as a, Latin America as a continent. But chocolate comes from Ivory Coast. And this is taken from the book that Tony Chocolonely put together in tracing their supply chain and understanding, not just for themselves, but how they can impact the world in abolishing uh, poverty, abolishing forced labor across the supply chain of the cocoa industry. And we can make the same kind of parallels with the fashion industry, because if I were to ask you, where does the best cotton come from? And I had France, Italy, Spain, and pretty much all of Europe, even New Zealand, and the answer isn't any of those countries. It's Pakistan, where is mainly uh, where uh, the largest percentage of our cotton comes from. And just like cotton and just like chocolate, this industry relies on cheap and easy exploitation in order to survive. When the cost of labor is so cheap and easy to exploit, investing in modern machinery doesn't make sense financially. Today, you're going to get after this class a list of references that help me build this, this class that you are seeing here. And one of the links is the Netflix show Rotten and the one specifically on chocolate. And I encourage you guys to watch it because it is an incredible body of work when it comes to looking deeply at the uh, chocolate industry. Now, you will see there that Belgium, of course, is the biggest player in the business with 2000 Belgian shops selling handcrafted high end truffles and other delicacies. And I know some of you said Belgium, you said Switzerland first, but Belgium is the one that is the biggest when it comes to treating the chocolate and turning it into, into those chocolate bars that you guys buy and eat. But from forced labor, 
labor, sorry, a global investigation of British documentary in 2000 recorded the troubling testimony that children were being trafficked to work in West African cocoa farms, a modern form of forced labor. The deadline to fix the industry was by 2005. We passed that mark, just so you know, and there was not enough change that, that has uh, happened. And because of COVID-19, schools are shut down and children in many parts of the world have been forced to go to work to provide for their families. And the cocoa industry is one of the biggest and along with the cotton industry to employ children and enforced labor, meaning they are forced to work and they are not being paid. They are being enslaved in order to provide for the global supply chain. So Tony, Tony Chocoloni put together a series called Bitter Chocolate Stories, where they have interviewed children, teenagers, working in West Africa and Ivory Coast in the biggest plantations of, of cocoa. And these kids have been taken from school at a very young age, and they haven't been able to go back to school. Their families often rely on them for uh, bringing in the funds. And Tony Chocolonely has made it their mission to abolish forced labor, at least in the cocoa industry, and to encourage and other suppliers to do the same. And we're going to look at their case study and the importance of, uh, of a solid case study that goes beyond charity, beyond the give back model, beyond paying for education, but very much as a regenerative system that looks at redesigning the very system itself. There are other examples that we're gonna look at as well um, in the fashion industry, and I will uh, guide you through them. But the entire business of the chocolate industry, and here you can also replace chocolate industry with cotton industry, with fashion industry, is established on exploitation and free labor. The world's chocolate companies have missed the deadlines to uproot child labor from their cocoa supply chain in 2005, in 2008, in 2010. And next year, they face another target date and industry officials indicate they probably will miss that too. As a result, the odds are substantial that a chocolate bar bought in the United States is the product of child labor. About two thirds of the world's cocoa supply comes from West Africa, where according to to a 2015 US Labor Department report, more than 2 million children were engaged in dangerous labor in cocoa growing regions. But let's make a parallel to fashion, honestly. It's not that different. The International Labor Organization, and you will get this link as well in your notes today, estimates that 170 million children are engaged in child labor with many making textile and garments to satisfy the demands of consumers in Europe, the US and beyond. Child labor is a particular issue for fashion because much of the supply chain requires low skilled labor and some tasks are even better suited for children than adults. In cotton picking, employers prefer to hire children for their small fingers, which do not damage the crops. This is a direct parallel between sustainability and colonialism, because the current industry is definitely relying mainly on the exploitation of labor. And we're going to look deeper into what does that look like and how can we go beyond it. So these are some of the images that the International Labor Organization has documented in cotton picking in Kazakhstan, in Pakistan, in Mongolia, and some of the child labor occurring in Bangladesh and other parts of Asia as well. And again, this is not a slide for us to just look at poverty porn, but this is a slide for us to visualize the relationship that exists between the food industry and the fashion industry when it comes to exploitation of labor, exploitation of the land, exploitation of children across our industries. And we are in 2020. This is not a thing of the past. This is an economic reality. And the reason why the industry relies so heavily on free labor forced labor, enslaved children is because of the prices. They don't want to budge on their margins. We're going to look at the best practices, of course, similarly to the chocolate industry, the fashion industry's business model relies on exploitation and unpaid labor. Enslaved human beings 
across the supply chain are picking the cotton, are manufacturing the clothes, are picking the cocoa, and they're not even the ones wearing them. Child labor in the cocoa industry looks something like this, and this is a diagram that Tony Chocolonely has created because the company didn't start by making chocolate. The company started in the beginning uh, by realizing that there were child labor enslaved children within the cocoa industry. And with that realization, the founder of Tony Chocolonely basically turned himself in into the police by saying that he himself is responsible of the child labor that is available in the chocolate industry because he's consuming the chocolate. And we're going to look deeper into that in the next class about the whole story behind Tony Chocolonely. But just to uh, let you know that the company started as an activism a movement to eradicate child labor across the industry, to eradicate uh, forced labor within the cocoa industry. And it has led them to lead by example, to showing the industry what is possible. Because there wasn't any case study available to show that something else could exist. Some stats, of course, uh, about the child labor in the, in the cocoa industry. And here you have the color coded uh, children not working versus children doing hazardous work in the cocoa production that are striped, children doing other work in the cocoa production, and children doing other work whatsoever across um, the supply chain of the cocoa industry. So child labor is something that, you know, in 2020, I cannot believe we're talking about this. <laughs> and of course, it's the idea that we rely on children in the global south to provide for adults and other children in the global north is basically what more do we want in terms of an example of what colonialism looks like in today's day and age under these economic pressures that we are facing. So how can we do better? Sustainability and colonialism are intertwined. Uh, exploitation of labor and of resources in the cocoa and in the industry stem from the very systems of oppressions that were imposed on the global south under the guise of progress and advancing developing countries. The direct impact of colonialism has been to impoverish, destabilize, and weaken the countries and territories where natural resources were needed to achieve imperial expansion. The only way forward is to design a new system. That's it. There's no other way. We can't just raise more money for charity. We cannot like there, charity alone cannot hold the pressure of a broken system. So let's look at how brands, individuals, organizations can work together into redesigning a system that works for the people and for the planet. If you want systemic change, you need to change it from within and you need to do it holistically and as a whole. And this is a wonderful piece of wisdom from the Tony Stroccoloni team because most of the time there is this understanding that we can boycott, we can protest, we can vote with our dollars, but all of these things are happening outside of the, of the system that we wanna be changing. Yes, we are all product of that system, but at the end of the day, if we do want to see change, we have to change from the inside. How many of you have read the book, No Logo by Naomi Klein? The way that this book is structured is that it explains this idea of a brand. And it also talks about what a hollow system is and how it's designed and how most brands rely on this hollow system to exist. So a hollow system is designed around a brand with no connection to human labor or natural resources. So it looks something like this. You see the dotted lines are related to the traders, which are a conglomerate of people. It's very decentralized. It's not just one trader. It's a bunch of traders that gather the resources and the labor on behalf of the brand. And basically everything that exists around the brand is around the logo, the marketing, the messaging, the communication, and talking directly to their uh, market or their consumers. But behind the scenes, there is no relationship between the brand itself and their production. And after the trader, there's complete opacity as to how or where and whether they can audit them, whether they can uh, apply some kind of uh, certifications to them. Beyond that point, it's completely opaque. 
And it's very hard for brand to reverse engineer. Once they are a hollow brand, it's very, very hard for them to reverse engineer and try to do things that are better for the world. So it looks something like this. The desire to go beyond this opacity is rare and generally the work of activists or idealists. And again, the activism work that people are doing is oftentimes unpaid for, not compensated. Like how can you pay for activism? How can you pay for someone wanting a better world? So beyond the point of the opacity, it's basically there's a, a big jump. I know this, I should have put like a, a, a larger gap between the opacity and the water because it really takes courage to go beyond that point. Regenerative systems designed with both people and planet look something like this. So when we are redesigning a system, we want, of course, there's a logo, there's a brand, there's people about you know, buying what they believe in, buying something that they relate to. Um, and oftentimes a logo and a brand is the, the closest thing we have to identifying with a product, identifying with an object. But the way that we want to design is where the brand is closer to their supply chain, is also feeding into cooperatives. We're gonna look into that, what are cooperatives? And we're gonna look at being directly related to factories, directly related to the assembly line, directly related to packaging, and while supporting the farmers as part of the cooperative and directly linking them with the factories. There aren't any legislation, so all of that work really relies on voluntary action. And we're gonna look a little bit at that at the very end of the slides. But Tony's Chocolony five sustainable sourcing principles are paying a premium uh, and fair trade wage, engaging in long-term relationships with the farmers, building and empowering strong cooperations. And I'm gonna explain what, the, what these are. We have a definition. Continuous improvement in production and quality, traceability from bean to bar, a similar system and a similar uh, basically uh, framework is also found in the brand Veja. And we're gonna look at it a little bit later. Veja, the running shoes. I don't know if you guys are familiar with uh, that brand as well, but they believe and they, they have built a similar framework to lead by example in building a system that is regenerative, that is close to their suppliers and building strong relationships with cooperatives. Transparency doesn't mean regenerative. Transparency doesn't mean sustainability. The fashion revolution uh, groups, I don't know if you guys are familiar with FashRev, they put together a transparency report basically last year and H&M and some of the big fast fashion groups ranked really top in terms of like transparency. And there was a big confusion about transparency being considered uh, equal to sustainability. Other brands have been also marketing heavily, uh, like heavily marketing on transparency to push for sustainability, but the two are not necessarily related. Now, when we do want a better system, we definitely need to start with a transparent model. We do need to understand what is at stake before we are able to redesign it all together. So it does start with an audit and it does start with us having a global perspective, a very holistic view on the system itself and the relationships and the complexities between the farmers, their communities, the environment, global politics, and the way that we are ex extracting resources from the land. Who is benefiting? How much money are, we being, are, are they being paid? Why is there poverty with, within every single supply chain uh, that exists today? So again, here, um, Tony Ciccoloni put together a, a checklist, essentially, pay above market value, and we're going to look into that, and there's a parallel with Veja, build schools and community centers, provide ongoing training, no poverty in the supply chain, no forced labor or child labor in the supply chain. To, to already have these goals is uh, very important, definitely, because sometimes we don't even have these goals, and then, therefore, without having big, bold goals, we are not able to basically reach them. So it definitely starts with transparency. It definitely starts with having big, bold goals in order to gear our efforts towards something. Let's look at an ethical production and trade beyond certification. Classic, classic, classic. Fair trade is not enough. Okay, and we can look at that deeper into the second class by answering questions directly with the Tony Chocolonely team. But from a fashion standpoint, fair trade 
is not enough because fair trade does not account for the environment and does not account for uh, the communities that are impacted by the trade. So Tony Chocolone said, we learn a hard lesson. Fair trade doesn't necessarily mean forced labor free. It doesn't. So what they decided to do is design Designing equity, designing with equity at the heart of it. Do you guys know the difference between equality and equity? I just want to just see if you guys are on the same page here when it comes to equity and what equity actually means. Inequality in the cocoa chain and the resulting extreme poverty are the root cause of forced labor, illegal child labor, and deforestation. And at Slow Factory, we work at the intersection of human rights and environmental justice. And we've been doing so for almost 10 years. And the relationship between the two is basically undeniable when we are talking about uh, you know, supply chain, sustainability, uh, climate positive solutions. Fair Trade and Tony Stoklonli share their vision on living income and use the same model for calculating the cocoa price that enables farmer to earn a living income. Fair Trade and Tony Stoklonli have improved existing models, integrate widely accepted benchmarks and research and share their insights with the chocolate industry on the living income reference price for cocoa. We call upon all chocolate companies to make a living income the norm and start using this model. So that is basically how they are giving back. They worked closely with fair trade in expanding their model because fair trade was not enough and was not built to eradicate poverty, was not built to eradicate child labor. So they teamed up with fair trade. Another company that has done so, Beja in the fashion industry, also went above and beyond to team up with fair trade and expand their model to take care of the, of the farmers, the extractivists and their communities. Again, just about equity, equality has to do with giving everyone the same resources, whereas equity involves distributing resources based on the needs of the recipients. So it's based on the needs. It definitely goes beyond then standardizing uh, the distribution of, uh, of, of resources. It goes into a model that is very close to the Global South way of functioning. It's a case by case. And other companies have understood that in working in the Global South, case by case, models are the basis of designing for equity. So applying progressive system design to the existing supply chain. System design in the fashion industry can be modeled after the progressive system design found in the food industry, where deeper relationships exist between both food and fashion because they both rely on agriculture, whether it's cotton, linen, bamboo, or farming, wool, cashmere, leather, the relationship of the land exists between the two. We worked with Fibershed. I don't know if some of you are familiar with Fibershed. Fibershed is a non-for-profit pushing and working and empowering regenerative agriculture right here in the United States and abroad in the global south. And with them, we worked on a series to explain what soil to soil means in the fashion industry mainly because that's where they work. But of course, the model can be found as well in the food industry. In fact, in the food industry, this model has already been implemented because the organic food and farm to table concepts already exist uh, in the food industry because uh, the public is much more um, aware and afraid of what goes in their bodies as opposed as to what goes on their bodies. And we are trying to push the boundaries and really embrace this idea that food and fashion are really relying on the same resources, which is the soil. So let's build a model that goes beyond fair trade and beyond the certifications established by the global north to police the global south. So just hiding behind a certification is not enough. It's not enough in 2020. We have to go beyond. Think about the guy that's diving beyond the opacity. We need everybody to be empowered and feel like they can be idealists. They can be designers. They can be activists. And they have the tools and the power to redesign these systems. Now, there are two categories, mainly in the fashion industry, raw materials and labor and manufacturing. Same exists with the food industry. Raw materials, uh, 
cocoa in the case of the Tony Chocolonely, but it can also mean coffee because there is also child labor found in, uh, in coffee. It pretty much in everything that comes from Africa, as Africa as a continent has been deeply impoverished by colonialism and the conglomerates of the global north uh, completely extracting its its resources without um, designing any kind of support or system or regenerative systems or regenerative economy around the labor itself. So we're gonna look at that together. So what are extractivists? Extractivist is usually used as a pejorative term, as a term that is a negative term that basically describes the people that are just extracting resources from the planet. But extractivists have been taking back that term, especially for the communities living and sustaining the natural habitats uh, that provides for them and for their families and for their communities. And in the case of Tony Chocolonely, it's the cocoa industry, it's the cocoa plant, the cacao. The new definition of extractivism is the practice of extracting resources from the earth all the while maintaining, preserving, and sustaining said resources in a regenerative and respectful way. Cooperatives, a farm, business, or other organization which is owned and run jointly by its members who share the profits or benefits. So cooperatives are community-run organizations that manage the resources, set the prices at which these resources will be sold to the global north, and make sure that every single member of their cooperative is gaining and being paid a living wage and sometimes even above the living wage so that their communities can thrive. And by building strong cooperatives, by investing in cooperatives, Tony Chocolonely was able to reach their goals faster, uh, specifically on eradicating poverty within at least their own supply chain. Which brings us to regenerative economy. These pictures are taken from the Veja trip that we took recently. I was personally invited to go to Amazonia to explore the supply chain of the Veja running shoes, particularly the sole of the running shoe made of wild rubber, wild rubber that is found in the Amazon rainforest. And we stayed and lived with the communities that live and work within the Amazon rainforest in extracting the natural rubber from the trees, all the while maintaining the livelihood of these trees, the livelihood of the ecosystem, and doing what we call environmental services. Veja, similarly to Tony Chocolonely, has uh, invested in the cooperatives that uh, are protecting these uh, communities. Not only that, they raised the price of rubber by at least seven times more than the global market so that their communities that are extracting rubber for Veja are able to sustain their communities, build schools, you know, and, and, and basically re retain their youth within that community. Because without the youth, without the health of these communities, the rainforest loses its uh, value. And if the rainforest loses its value, then you see what happens. You know, there are mass fires that are being created by, by people that are on purpose destroying the land so that it can turn into, into pasture to, to raise cattle. So by elevating the value of the rainforest, Veja is able to maintain these communities, but not only that, is also able to sustain the livelihood and the ecosystem within, within which these communities exist. That's regenerative economy. Again, we, we teamed up with the Rainforest Alliance to talk about regenerative economy. I think it was last week. So this is a perfect timing to put together this definition for you all because the regenerative economy is an ongoing redefining concept that we are trying to perfect so that we can have a sort of a compass to guide us towards something that we can commonly understand and build for and, and demand. A regenerative economy is organized around the proper valuation and replenishment of natural capital, the abundance provided by nature. It is the opposite of extractive model, which depletes and destroys natural resources, regardless of the consequences for people and nature. In a rural context, community land rights provide a strong foundation for regenerative economies. These rights enable local people to harvest the fruits of their own labor and steward their precious natural resources in a way that fosters ecosystem health, economic stability, and community well-being over long term.
And here we've broken it down into the eight principles of regenerative rural economy, health and resilience in the communities, diversity and cross-fertilization, so very much rooted into agroforestry, circularity flow of money because of the agroforestry, which means we're planting multiple things beyond cocoa and or beyond coffee and or beyond cotton, then there is a, an abundance of economy maintaining the balance of the ecosystem, of the communities, awareness and interdependence, interdependence, sorry, holistic definition of wealth, adaptation and innovation amid constantly changing conditions and shared prosperity and participatory design making decisions. So after that, you can completely understand that a brand is an ecosystem. From the extractivist, there are each farmer basically uh, provides for five members of their community and then there are the schools related to that, health and safety. Let's take a look at it. Multiply that by the number of people involved in a supply chain to calculate the impact a brand has on human rights and environmental justice. So this is modeled after the socio-economical system model of Yuri Bronfenbrenner in 1979, where it starts with the individual, the micro-ecosystem, families, schools, neighborhood, the meso system that incorporates these communities, families, and these communities' resources. The exosystem, where work settings are being involved, there are social services that are being involved, and the macro system, social, economic, cultural, historical influences. But let's apply that system and look at legislation and accountability. Going back again to Tony Ciccoloni, they didn't just do this for themselves. They really empowered the rest of the industry to push for their five principles, to adopt them uh, by creating pressure, by uh, starting a, a petition, by lobbying, by working directly with uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the factories, the chocolate factories in Europe, and uh, imposing this type of change across their own industry. Do you guys know the difference between responsibility and accountability? So you can see here that in the boat, all four of them are responsible of, they're all responsible of what's going on. Every one of them is responsible. But accountability is taking action. It's really building on the values that we share commonly. So we're going to look right now about values, regenerative economies, re Oops, I wrote regenerative economy twice, but this is not supposed to happen. Climate positive solutions and community centric strategies. Let's look at values. This is how we build an accountability framework. So a framework that is based on action, based on accountability that goes beyond responsibility. Some of the values can be equity, solidarity, justice, trust, kinship, ecosystems, sincerity, tolerance, a company cannot function if they don't have their values already defined, well-defined, or it can definitely function, but it will continue to exploit at a rate that is alarming and that is not encouraged at this time because we only have around eight years before we can address global climate change in an effective way. And we need everyone. I am part of Progressive International as a council member. For those of you who don't know what it is, it is a common uh, global progressive front that is international and that looks at applying these values of democratic, decolonized, just, egalitarian, liberated, solidaristic, sustainable, ecological, peaceful, post-capitalist, prosperous, and plural across all nations from the ground up and from the top down. And why am I proposing these values? It is for us to look at values that are bold, that are progressive, that exist out there for brands to take, um, to take this into uh, as an example. We want to see the values that brands are sharing with us. I think that we are in a time now where it's not only about making one impact or one gesture. It's really about incorporating these values within our own system. That is how we design these regenerative systems because at the base of it, they share a common value with, um, between, between the team members, between the, the leadership teams, as well as between the communities that are employed to make this brand 
a success to, to make this brand possible. So we are closing the chapter on from food to fashion and I have a little exercise for you. Based on everything we've discussed on Tony's Chocolonely case study, in your opinion, what might be the key takeaways the fashion industry can learn from the food industry? Use the chat box to send us your ideas, but also if you wanna take time to think about it, to draw systems and to show me your systems, if you are posting anything on social media, I would encourage you to tag the Slow Factory so that we can see what you are working on. And right now, without further ado, I wanna to present to you my special guest, Dr. Arielle Johnson is a flavor scientist, author, and food innovator. After receiving her PhD in flavor chemistry from UC Davis, she co-founded the Noma Fermentation Lab in Copenhagen, Denmark, and is currently the science officer for Alton Brown's Good Eats on the Food Network. Well, I'm not going to read all the... the, the no, 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 you don't, definitely don't have to. Um, we can like, go to the next, <laughs> the next slide. So um, I'm going to talk about chocolate flavor and how it is created by the, the systems around chocolate. So hi, I'm Dr. Ariel Johnson. Um, I have a PhD. I did my research in the UC Davis Department of Viticulture and Enology. I have done a lot of work with like creative R&D in the restaurant industry. I also do a lot of educational stuff about food science, chemistry, biology, and flavor. Some of that's through Good Eats, some of that's through writing. I'm writing a book right now about that, but I'm particularly particularly interested in the chemistry of flavor, but also how larger systems get translated and create the flavor that shows up on the plate. So when we, you know, there's lots of different angles that we could look at chocolate through to uh, to analyze it. The one that I'm going to focus on is that chocolate is both a sensory object and a system. We grow chocolate, we buy chocolate specifically because of its flavor and sensory properties. Those are the things that we like about it. It is a, even in, an, in the bulk or commodity sense, um, something that we buy and produce specifically for these sort of like pleasurable, as we would say in sensory science, hedonic characteristics. But all of those things are completely inseparable from the systems that create it. And this is a thing where a lot of the uh, students in the class are fashion oriented people, people in the fashion business. A lot of products in, in fashion materials can be analyzed in a similar way. So even if you're not going to go and have or do a, a food company. I think there's still some useful parallels. Yeah, so the way that I look at the relationship between flavor, labor, and natural resources is that uh, producing chocolate is a series of relationships between people, plants, and ecosystems that creates flavor at every step. In a lot of the academic food science um, that I've studied myself and drawn upon to do my educational work. People look very intensely at food molecules and production completely divorced from people and the, the human side is not really addressed very much. But uh, fortunately, if we know how nature and humans work together in the production process of chocolate and we know where flavor comes from, we can identify the connections anyway. So uh, the human botanical and ecological components of chocolate flavor aren't separable from what you taste. They literally create it. So I am I am not really an ecologist or a labor person. I recognize that they're important, but what I can help with is making those connections about where those points translate quite, quite literally and chemically into flavor. If we're trying to talk about systems and designing more regenerative, sustainable, and equitable systems, understanding the processes that create what we're looking for, in this case, flavor, understanding how they function and understanding where the sort of leverage points are will allow you to design a system that takes those into account with the basic parameters of human rights, social justice, and ecological justice. Okay, so as, as a scientist, I like to define my terms. What is flavor? Uh, if you were here at the class last week for olive oil, you've heard this before. Um, the two big parts is that flavor is a combination of taste and smell. Taste, 
senses things like sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and umami, also things like astringency and spiciness, pretty much everything else, uh, whether that's like roasty flavors, malty ones, buttery, funky, rosy, thousands upon thousands, so I can't list them all. Those come from smell. So you actually, your, your, uh, the physiology of your skull actually allows you to smell food while it's in your mouth. And your brain plays a trick on you and makes it feel like that is being sensed on your tongue, but it is actually being sensed by your nose. Flavors come from molecules. So taste and smell are both chemical senses. The perception that you get literally comes from molecules binding to receptors. So if we are able to identify molecules, we can understand the flavor better. So here's here's some cool flavor molecules. Um, we have eugenol, uh, which gives the clove flavor of cloves. Um, on the right-hand side, those are some more chocolate-related flavors. Furral, it gives you kind of a woody, bready caramel flavor. Uh, two acids, furan is toasty and sweet. Cyclotene gives you some mapley caramel flavors. So, uh, you know, these are all sensations that we experience and they all come from molecules and blends of molecules. Okay, so if you asked a physical chemist what chocolate is, they would tell you that it is a crystal lattice of fats, that is a continuous phase that encases cocoa solids and sugar. Basically, the uh, the cocoa butter is is a what gives the chocolate its uh, its texture and its solidity, and that cocoa butter encases cocoa solids, cocoa particles. Uh, that's where most of the flavor is, and pieces of sugar. But um, you know, knowing that that actually is not super useful or the whole story. Because we're not just interested in like there are cocoa particles and that's where we are. These these are if you were looking at the same review articles that I was looking at, basically all, all of the steps, all of the parameters where chocolate flavor creation happens. And of course we're not going to look at every single one of them, um, but break out some of the uh, important basics. So, so the points where flavor gets created in, in chocolate uh, are the cacao varietal, uh, it's, it's genetics, also the selection of the varietal and the site, how those genetics and the environment interact uh, the agricultural production methods, the um, surrounding surrounding biome around the plants, other plants, uh, fungi, insects that it interacts with, harvest time, but um, also the fermentation step is particularly important, roasting, and finally uh, grinding, conching, and tempering. Okay, yeah, the three I'm going to focus on are the what flavor gets created from the agricultural steps, what flavor gets created from the fermentation steps, and finally, what gets created during roasting. Cacao, chocolate cacao comes from the seeds of the Theobroma cacao plant. Um, it comes in these sort of thick pods with uh, fruity flesh around the seeds. So most of what gets created by, by the actual plant are what we call precursors, things that will become flavors later. So ev everything in the agricultural and growing steps is about laying the groundwork for the flavors that will come and be created later. Most of those precursors are sugars, proteins, fats, fiber, and polyphenols. Um, so at this point, we have bitter flavors, some sweet flavors, and some astringent flavors um, from, the, from the polyphenols. Those are basically antioxidant molecules. The plant has been tended and shepherded and harvested. The next step is cacao fermentation. This is not super obvious in the final flavor profile of chocolate in, in a sort of intellectual way. I mean, when you, when you taste chocolate, you don't necessarily think of it as a fermented thing. It doesn't really taste like cheese or like miso or anything like that, but this is like completely essential for later flavor development during roasting. The fermentation is a wild fermentation. There are uh, yeasts and bacteria that start fermenting the pulp and then they move inwards into the, uh, the seed itself. So some of the things that happen is creation of alcohols and acids, which starts breaking down and opening up enzymatic activity within the seed itself. There's breaking down of proteins and carbohydrates into more reactive, reactive things that will create flavor later, and also the oxidation of some of those polyphenols. So this, this fermentation stage actually helps temper some of the bitterness and astringency of those polyphenols. I mean, and I think it's important to point out here that, I mean, it's a wild microbe fermentation, but it doesn't just happen on its own. 
So fermentation is really a delicate partnership between humans and microbes. And the human role is making sure that the microbes have the things they want to eat, uh, the right amount of air exposure, the right levels of temperature and humidity. And in terms of doing their thing, in exchange, the microbes will transform the ingredient that they're fermenting biochemically and create new flavors at the molecular level. So this is less about like, oh, fermentation happens and more a really tastably evident example of the interaction between labor and nurturing and flavor development. Okay, so the last the last stage in flavor development, the, the layers upon layers of changes that chocolate goes through is the roasting process. You know, so in the last fermentation process, we created acids that helped with chemical transformations. Here we boil off some of them, so it's not quite so harsh. The big reaction that happens is actually a very fascinating complex of reactions uh, where the the chocolate flavor is knit together by the Maillard reaction. Um, Basically, you have sugars and amino acids that you created in the fermentation step by breaking down uh, carbohydrates and proteins, and those uh, go together in hot and dry conditions, do a lot of crazy stuff, and out the other end comes malty, roasty, toasted, cocoa-y, caramel, nutty, coffee, all types of brown, toasted, roasted flavors. So everything that happens here depends on what was built in the growing and fermentation steps. So, you know, roasting, the roasting of cacao, often if you're a small chocolate maker in like in Europe or the US, you'll get like raw, fermented raw dried beans and then do the roasting yourself. You know, we can't, we tend to associate that labor with chocolate making, but everything, everything that is, uh, becomes flavor in this step was created by the, by the labor of workers uh, in the agricultural and fermentation stages. So, so the, the really important thing to, to remember with this is none of this is innate. None of this just happens. It's, it's stewarded by working humans working within an ecological system. So, you know, remember that flavor is molecular. It's about creating and rearranging building blocks but it's not enough to focus on the microsystem. The macro of that is that the work of cultivation, culturing, and cooking are all reflected in the flavors that they create. This means that human work and labor and the ecological experience the plant goes through, the ecological interaction between humans and their environment is literally tasteable. So since sustainability and equity only work at a systemic level. They're not like static things that we achieve. They are systems that we're constantly working on. F- flavor is also a system. It comes from a system. It's, it's produced in a system and it reflects the system. So knowing how these two systems interact a little bit, knowing where the leverage points are um, can help for you to redesign a production process that put these systems together in a better way. Thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. I, I mean, uh, this is like what I love talking about. So, uh, Me too. <laughs> thank you so much, Ariel. I'm going to click on the Q&A. So thank you so much, Ariel. Class, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you have a lot of questions. I hope it was informative, inspiring. Um, I also wanted to let you know that uh, we have 15 minutes for questions, and um, we would love to, you know, get your feedback. So are fast fashion companies like AliExpress, Pretty Little Things, Fashion Nova, Hollow Companies. I haven't audited them, but the answer to that, AliExpress is like Amazon. So they are definitely not related to the production of the items that they are selling. And I, I can't I can't for sure speak to all of it, but any company that isn't really rooted in the communities that they are employing or extracting resources from are considered hollow companies. In the book of Naomi Klein, she uses Nike as the example. Nike as a large American corporation that is recognized by the swoosh logo and the cult following of that swoosh logo across the cultures, uh, you know, across cultures, basically they have achieved, you know, an international following uh, without having a necessarily, you know, any ties to their production, any ties to their uh, resources that are being used 
to create those garments and also doesn't have any relationship to how these items, these garments are being discarded into the, into the, the environment, into, uh, you know, put on, on donation tracks to back to West Africa uh, to clog up the, the, the markets there. So it's not a, a, a brand that's connected let's say, to or grounded into the communities that they are em employing. And someone here, Ariel Crawford, says in the chat that Fashion Nova uses forced labor prison in China. And I think a lot of brands were accused to uh, using forced labor uh, in China and around the world. Again, this is not to shame any company. This is to provide uh, a way out because we can shame and we can blackmail and we can protest, but it's not really changing the course of action that we are facing. So that's why we focus these classes on design and designing new systems in particular particular and looking at case studies that are available. So I think I, I replied to this one. Who designed this system? Kyla Lopez. Uh, which system? The, the system that I showed today? Uh, I designed those systems for the purpose of this class. Um, they are, of course, you know, cookie cutter uh, systems. They are not apply, apply, like they're, they could be applied. Of course, you can use them as blueprints, but uh, they are not, I mean, they need to be developed. You can start with that. They are great frameworks, but they are not ready to, to be implemented. We need to push them a little further. Uh, would it be possible to share examples if there are any of multinational companies that have or are adopting a regenerative model? We can work on that. Uh, we can work on that. However, Slow Factory is very... Um, strict when it comes to endorsing companies. We work with a lot of companies. However, we're not a certification, uh, not yet at all, uh, actually. And we are not here to put together a list of safe brands to, to encourage purchases from. Uh, we could do that, but we aren't doing that as of now. Um, if you are interested, I would encourage for you guys to look into the Rainforest Alliance follow the frog. Their frog is a seal of certification for regenerative systems, at least in, um, the, in Latin America, uh, where they are working directly with indigenous and uh, local communities that live and work within the, the, the rainforest. So check them out, and I'm sure you will be able to find uh, some regenerative models there. What are the audits recommended to do? I have seen SA8000, Fair Labor, labor A's, and self-audits like HIG Index, yes, but not sure which one to recommend for the company I work for since that also involves a fee. Yes, absolutely. There are uh, audit, auditors that are um, uh, built on human, uh, human basically, um, judgment. <laughs> they send a bunch of humans to establish um, whether or not the, the system is okay. Uh, they build risk analysis, but I would encourage for your company to engage with uh, data-driven uh, organizations such as, and I'm going to type the answer here, source map or the um, apparel, the OAR, the OAR, it's Open Apparel Registry. Look into those and uh, and see if that is something that uh, you know provides your your company a, a good return on investment because they do audit, but at the same time they provide risk analysis. They provide the data. It's like a system basically that uh, can be used to uh, build upon. Is the purpose of using natural rubber in your of other naturally derived materials a better sustainable alternative? There aren't any other natural material besides wild rubber that can be built for the soles. And even the soles are mixed with uh, synthetic rubber for durability. Are there any chocolate alternatives that could di divert the massive demand for it? I don't know how to answer that question, Ariel. Is there any chocolate alternative that could mimic the taste of chocolate that we can invest in? Well, I mean, you know, uh, car carob was big when I was a kid as a uh, as a chocolate alternative. Oh yeah, carob, car carob chips. I love carob. Um, I mean, I guess, I guess something I think about a lot is 
is, is looking not so much at like replacing one thing with another thing, but um, making, making, figuring out how to make like a, a larger like complexity of things, a larger variety of things more, more available and more accessible. So, you know, probably replacing chocolate with one thing is not going to be going to be feasible without like running into a lot of the same issues like systemically that we've got with chocolate but i mean a, a lot of the flavors that we like about chocolate you know come from fermentation come from like roasting and thermal processing so you know if we're if we're able to like shift the mindset a little bit from like well i want this to taste exactly like chocolate to like this has flavors that i like there's lots of things that we can we can, I mean, one thing, I did not develop this dish, but I, I uh, when I was working at Noma, one of the, the pastry chef, Rocio Sanchez, who's um, super brilliant, we had a lot of uh, a lot of koji. So it's like barley inoculated with the mold Aspergillus arise. Um, it's the first step in making sake or miso, um, but it gets really sweet. There's a lot of like the starches get converted into sugars. Um, so she was, she was roasting it um, and it was developing these amazing, like, malty, chocolatey flavors. Um, and she ended up making a, like, mole-like sauce Yummy. out of it. So, I mean, that's another example of combining, yeah, a fermentation and then roasting to get not literally chocolate, but um, if you like chocolate flavors, you'll probably like those flavors. How do we make people more open to paying premium prices? Uh, Ramya asked, and not everybody can afford to pay these prices, especially when it comes to clothing or more necessary products. So how do we cope with that? That's such a great question. We get this question all the time, whether we're talking about the sustainable fashion world or we're talking about, you know, um, ethical food production, there is a price to be paid. Someone has to pay that price. It's either a child or it's either the individual at the end of it in the global north that is also experiencing discrimination, poverty, oppression. So um, yes, the question around price is always a tricky one. Uh, that being said, uh, there is ways to create pressure on the companies that, uh, that are more affordable and to pressure them into redistributing the, the wealth uh, that, they, um, that they have amassed uh, into producing in such, at such a rate on such oppressive terms for, you know, uh, at least 50, 60 years. <laughs> so there are ways to redistribute wealth. And these are the types of pressures that we want to put on the industry. And yes, um, the question of pricing, I mean, I don't know how to answer that. I don't know if Ariel or Idali wants to jump in. Um, it's true that, uh, that the price of chocolate is um, underestimated uh, because it, you know, the, the labor is not taking into account. Uh, labor is not being paid, so how are we, you know, pricing the chocolate properly? Um, I, I, Ariel or Idali, do you want to jump in? Yes, I'll I'll jump in here. I think I think for us, we always make sure that um, we pay. So we start with the premium, and then we build towards the price of our chocolate. But then next to that, if you look at like our chocolate, is it's a little bigger and a little chunkier than the rest. So that's how we, towards the consumer, we try to like uh, compensate the higher price. But what we want the consumer to understand is that you're not just paying a price for us to like have a, you're not paying for the marketing. You're really paying so we can pay our, so we can pay the farmers a living wage for the cocoa that we buy from them. Because if you look at um, other brands, you see they have like a lot of commercials on TV and they spend a lot of money on marketing. We don't do any of that. So we do, we have a policy of no media advertisement, no pay, paid media, because we really want to allocate our dollars and have it go back to supporting our supply chain and delivering like a good product. So for us, it's about finding that, that balance. Definitely. Many design students and entrepreneurs struggle to make money and gain exposure while working only in community projects and sustainable design versus working for large companies. How can students achieve both realistically? I mean, for us, we always encourage the designers that we train to go work for large companies and to change the system from within. And of course, that sounds easier said than done. And we have been in those places and we continue to push boundaries in working with large companies like, uh, I'm not gonna name them, but you know you know the companies we work with that are huge. So we do work with large companies and we push for design change 
from the uh, from inside because otherwise um, it will be very difficult to uh, create change from the outside of the industry. So yes, if you are trained to become a designer, um, go work for large companies if you want to, but you have a responsibility and accountability to push for change from within the company. Looks like so, some in the Q and A. I can, yeah, I can try to I can try to what rapid fire. Mycelium. Um, oh, mycelium. Yeah, I mean, uh, so mycelium. Oh, that's okay. Oh, mycelium. Actually, I f- mushroom nerds. My, mycelium is the uh, sort of microtubular structure that uh, that fungi build themselves out of. Um, so mushroom is just basically the fruit of a the mushroom organism, and most of it is actually this fibrous mycelium. I know a lot of people. Yeah, or like looking at mycelium as like packaging, um, as like a sustainable alternative to like cardboard and insulation. I've seen like mycelium used for hats and stuff. I don't actually know if anyone's used it uh, for soling shoes. It might be one of those things where like like composite materials like mycelium plus another material might might have like a synergistic thing. I'm not sure how well it would work on its own as a shoe material, but that's definitely a... Uh, design project worth worth looking into definitely and there are uh, we are working on uh, several mycelium projects at slow factory mm. we're going to be uh, co-launching with a company called bolt thread uh, so check out bolt thread as an alternative that's definitely for the fashion industry uh, i have to hang up because that's it <laughs> it's over. Yes. for ariel are there any books or resources providing information on the science of flavor that you could recommend well <laughs> I-, I am writing one it's, it's not out yet Actually, there's one coming out next month by Harold McGee, a uh, very germinal figure in in gastronomy and science. Uh, He wrote On Food and Cooking. So it's his latest book. It's called Nosedive, uh, Field Guide to the World Smells. Um, And as we know, uh, smell is is the largest part of flavor. So he goes like super deep into how all of those smells and flavors are produced and how those relate to... um, metabolism of organisms and 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 landscape and such so i think that's i think it's out maybe in two or three weeks the that's the best book i've read out on the market about how smells and particularly flavor chemistry works for a broad audience there's also if you want to get into brain stuff uh neurogastronomy by gordon shepherd um how how the brain creates flavor um is is a is a fairly dense but very good read if you want to take a deep dive into that thank you all so much for your questions we are recording them and we are going to be answering by email Uh, we're also going to send you a a, a feedback uh, sheet so that you can continue engaging with us and asking questions and commenting on the content that we are providing thank you so much ariel thank you idly and the tony chocolonis team and to my slow factory team thank you so much Bye, have a good day.